on a one to scale of one to ten, that's ten. But make sure you hit the record button. Uh, but if you're here in the uh, here with us at the powerhouse, you've got a great assortment of uh, some pizza and sodas and things like that. So a little motivation. I just kind of emphasize: please uh, come in person to follow on meetings. Once I get an okay from my uh, my tech. Uh, Expert, I'll go ahead and get kind of get started and we can talk whenever you're uh, sure. Are you going to share your slides on here? Am I going to? I don't have it on here. You have it. Okay. Can you share it on yours? Yes. A few, a few little technical glitches, but uh, you know, nothing, uh, nothing horrible. We'll get this slide share here and then we'll go. So, just so y'all know, I thought I started uh, putting this together and I go, oh, this will be about 45 minutes. So then I went through it, there's an hour and 15 minutes. Now, it was a Friday afternoon, and nobody wants to be sitting in a talk for an hour and 15 minutes. So I uh, got this down to, I think was about 45 minutes, and then we'll do some Q&A. So hopefully we'll, we'll be done uh, at about the right time. So I think, can, there, can you all see that? I know we can see it here in the classroom. Let me just get something from the uh, distance. Uh, are yeah, you're doing good. Slide? Showing well. Somebody say something. You see it? Okay. Getting thumbs up. Getting some thumbs up. All right. Well, welcome. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Greg Marzov. I get the distinct privilege uh, to have a little bit of your time. And thank you for giving me some of your time. I've been looking forward to this. We've been doing these Friday uh, sessions, a uh, lunch sessions for some time. And uh, uh, quite a few folks were signing up, but we had some openings, so I thought I would jump at this opportunity. Uh, kind of the idea today is, is, of course, not in 45 minutes to make anybody an expert in this, but I'm try going to try to lay the framework for you and kind of standardize this and put some things in perspective that uh, maybe you don't know. Um, we tend to spend a lot of time in some of the detail aspects of uh, systems engineering, I think, uh, but we don't spend a lot of time and maybe some of the critical threads that just don't go vertically across the uh, the developmental cycle, but go horizontally across. And uh, T and E, uh, our V and V, uh, we'll talk kind of what those terms mean are uh, critical because I think it runs pretty uh, rigorously from beginning to end. Okay, and we tend to miss that. We think of it, well, it's just in development or it's just here or it's just there. The truth is, is it really runs across all of it. So I'll, I'll, try, I'll paint that picture for you uh, today. And then I'll give you some ideas of what I think works uh, well. And, uh, I know it doesn't work well. Uh, but some things that maybe work well that can maybe uh, help you a bit. Okay, so are you going to flip these things or you want me to, can you flip them? All right, so let's go. So my experience with this, and I'll just be brief with this, because I, 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 I was started to do t and &E, uh, work back at the U.S. Air Force Weapons School. I was a student there in 1996, and they would give us these uh, pretty tough tactical problems, and then it was up to each student to try to figure out a way to solve the problem. And then we'd actually go fly it, and we instrument it, and we would go test it. And then we would come back and do an evaluation and try to determine what worked and what didn't work. And we didn't call it TNE, but that's essentially what we were doing. Uh, and then uh, I did that for quite a few years and then uh, working on best practice stuff too. Like, hey, what are we going to do as a combat air force uh, to go into harm's way and to come out successful? So um, I was one of the brain brainchilds behind that uh, for quite some years. And then later had the opportunity to actually do operational tests for the Air Force for um, all of our fighter uh, uh, systems, our bomber systems, uh, high altitude recce uh, systems, unmanned systems, and also uh, nuclear uh, free fall and uh, uh, cruise missiles. Uh, some reliability aspects here that we were doing and evaluating. So I, I really got into, the, into this pretty big and I was thrilled when I retired in 2017 to be asked to put together a kind of a test class, um, which I jumped at and uh, I've been teaching that every spring. Uh, so it's a 603 course, uh, not an easy course, I don't think, but it's uh, 
a lot of fun, and I'm I'm thrilled to be here today and at least share some of this with you. So that's that's my experience. Uh, if you're interested in it, please reach out to me. I would love to talk with you about anything to do with TND. This is exciting. It's just a great, uh, in my opinion, it's like if you a systems engineer or test engineer, I'd probably rather be the test engineer. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, let's let's press to the next slide. I'm going to go very quickly uh, through these first few bullets uh, on success and problem areas and, uh, and some of the acquisition uh, cycle. Uh, we'll get to the right slide here in this moment. Uh, because if for time's sake, I just don't have time to cover that. I've got a bunch of slides hidden, but we're not going to, we'll talk just very briefly. I want to get to the TAD and the B and B considerations. That's why you're here. And that's what I want to share with you. And then we'll do a little execution to kind of see maybe what this looks like. Go ahead, if you would, please. So let's just look at scorecards. You know, how are we doing? You would think with all of our technology and we've been doing the systems engineering thing for a while and we have this all figured out. If you look at the scorecards, uh, go to the next slide, please. This is a FY22 Director of uh, Operational Test and Eval uh, uh, report here on the effectiveness. So uh, let me just give you a quick snippet. So director of ot and &E is congressionally mandated body. This person works for the Secretary of Defense and their job is solely to look at are the systems that we're putting in operational test, which is the validation of the system, which is essentially asking, does the system work as it was intended to work in the environments that we needed to work in? Um, how well are we doing? The idea is we do this before full rate production. We do this kind of, we do some low rate initial production to get some production representative items. And then we do operational tests and validate and yes, in fact, the system does what we need it to do before we go to full rate production. So this is kind of like the acid test, okay? Of, of how well did we do in the development of a system? And you can see there, from an effectiveness perspective, average over the, about the last six or seven years is about 54%, which is dismal, right? You would think, hey, from at least effectiveness, like performance aspects, that would be good. Uh, and what kind of, you can see in 22 is a little better, but I would tell you if you went back like 10 years ago in 05, 06, uh, maybe 15 years ago, and you looked in, you would say, well, it must've been really bad then. Well, the truth is it's about set. So we're really not getting a whole lot better on the effect of this one. And what uh, is a little more dismal, if we go to the next slide, is the suitability aspect. So suitability, in my estimation, I think Vinny uh, Pagano would agree with me, is this is the reliability, maintainability, availability, the illities that makes it suitable for use, which I think is, 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 hard, is harder than just performance aspects in many ways is a, a, a whopping 38% last year. So we're really struggling in the suitability aspects. And this too has been quite poor over the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, next slide, please. Survivability, so you say, well, we need survivability. Well, these are the, the Department of Defense programs. So these systems generally operate in the tested environment. So survivability is also important. And you can see here that uh, this is uh, probably a bit bad. So you're so I'm not just painting this to say, hey, this is like the world's the sky's falling, the sky's not falling. But there's reasons for this, and I think as engineers, particularly systems engineers and test engineers, is that we have an opportunity here to try to make this better. And so uh, learning about what's going on and how do we do it and make it better is is part of the key task uh, of why we're here. I think kind of the, what makes it fun and exciting. Right. Uh, so uh, please go to the next slide. Uh, this is civilian programs. Now, this isn't uh, as current uh, as, uh, as the, the FY22 numbers. But if you look from civilian perspective, you just look at costs overruns. Because part of a successful system isn't just the fact that it works, but how did you do on cost and schedule? Right. Kind of the, the, the iron triangle aspects, the other two parts of the triangle that are also very important. Uh, and the truth is, is we don't always do right here. It doesn't mean we don't have successful systems and programs. We do. But you can look at the Dreamliner, this Boeing 787, and you would find that it's four times over budget and schedule. And it was...
We lost the audio feed on Zoom. I think, yeah, I think the lecture got muted. Established folks that do this, that's been doing it for you know decades and decades, are still struggling with these problem sets. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to jump, start jumping in and kind of transitioning here just a bit. So the, the kind of the motivation, if you've taken my class, the 501, or if you spend any time in systems engineering, you, you know right off the get-go that the, kind of the idea here is that we don't want to be doing late design changes. Like with design changes that come late in a program drive a huge bill, right? And you can see there from current practices, if you're doing it on the left, you've got the costs. And on the bottom, you got the kind of the time from major program phases from start to, to, to end. Uh, you, you can see that if you do stuff late, uh, you're going to drop a big bill because you have one thing affects a thousand other things. And you have all the regression tests to do and all the major redesign. And you end up with a snowball effect and it ends up costing a lot of time and schedule, of time and money. Uh, and many times, it doesn't always get you the performance that you're looking for, which just leads to some other change, right? So the idea here is to try to get things done early. Get on the correct path as early as you can, and then try to stay on the correct path as you go through a program and a system development so that you can keep things on schedule, on cost, and hopefully uh, reap the performance that you're looking for. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, how does that happen exactly? So that sounds easy enough. But what, what are the key things that I, I just want to point out to you? Because I think this fills, uh, goes in really good with the, uh, the test aspects is you just don't do that. Uh, the way that you do that is you have key milestones, is you have review points along the, the acquisition process. So you just don't say, hey, we're going to do things early. But you have to have some checks and balances along the way. So you do some work. And then you verify or validate that work to confirm and gain confidence that, yes, in fact, we are doing things correctly. Uh, you go a little bit farther. You have another design review or another uh, some type of check and balance that says, yes, it's a milestone. And before you continue on, so the idea here is you don't get to the end of the program and realize that, hey, we didn't build the right thing. You, you do the checks along the way, right? And you don't commit more to it until you have a good confidence that you are, are in a good position uh, to step off of for the next phase or whatnot. There's a bunch of uh, reviews and concepts and you know every, I think most of us understand preliminary design reviews and critical design reviews, but there's a lot of other ones here. Uh, as, and depending on what acquisition cycle, department, defense, you know, the 5,000.02 series of milestone A, B, C, and so forth. If you look at the NASA, they have uh, similar ones, a little different, but it doesn't matter which one you use, just realize that they all generally will prescribe some kind of uh, review like this. All right. Go ahead, please. All right, so success. What are we? What is it that we're trying to do? Well, we like a system that's going to meet requirements, right, and development objectives, and we want it to be successful in the field. Uh, that's really important, and it has a long, you know, useful life, and hopefully on budget and on schedule. Okay, that seems really simple. And, and, and I, okay, let's just start simple. And then let's look at this, uh, kind of this definition of systems engineering, and that's to kind of guide this effort, right? The engineering development of complex systems, uh, which means we, we, in guiding it, we need to choose a, a path, but not just any path. We, we want to find the correct path from many paths, which means there's uncertainty. Inherent in the process is great uncertainty, which is why I tell you earlier that kind of this golden thread that runs from the getting the end across to systems engineering and the development life cycle is testing about because this is the process where you get your questions answered. Okay. So, and there's different ways to do it. So we're going to talk about some of those different ways today. Okay. So that's what we're, we're in search of. Hello. I'm so sorry. Did this, has this always been here or did this get mapped from else? You brought in me. You're going to get in so much trouble. Did we, did we steal it? I'm oh, sorry. We've got a stolen Okay. Don't worry. I got, I got you. All right. Thanks. Let's go next slide, please. So we have this wonderful thing we call the systems engineering V, right? And uh, well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'm uh, kind of making the assumption that my audience is 
somewhat versed in this, but just in, in broad brush, we start up in the upper left with a needs analysis and some feasibility, and then we decompose uh, down uh, in search of knowledge, because we, if you're dealing with the state of the art and uncertainties, we have questions that need answers. So there is a test and eval uh, component that's happening all along the left side of that, that V that's not entirely obvious. At the bottom, we start building, and then there is a integration and aggregation aspect that goes up the right side of the V that is also heavy test and eval dependent. So it's not the fact that, hey, the test and eval or V and V is something that like the speed bump at the end. The truth is, is that it's integrated throughout that entire V. And I'm gonna show you how here in just a moment. Go ahead, please. Now, we spoke earlier about kind of the objectives, right? Is that we have uncertainties, we don't wanna to wait to the end. So we're trying to get the risk down as early as possible with the program. And this is how we do it. So that risk, uh, we're going to hit this uh, pretty hard on the early side, okay? So we don't want to do it late. We want to get it down as early as possible. And we're going to do that. This, uh, the phases that you see on the on the bottom are the, uh, in the 501 tax, it's a cozy call uh, tax. We use a generic life cycle model that goes through needs analysis, exploration, definition, and through an engineering development and then onto a post development, which includes production. So that's what you're seeing there if you're wondering. That's that, but it's basically you can kind of start to end. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk about some tests. Go ahead. Uh, you're not alone. That's first thing. Uh, you're not going to have the answers to everything. I way, you know, there's so much, the more you learn, the more you learn, you don't know, right? So I would encourage you, if you're interested, subscribe to this. It's about 75 bucks a year. I think there's a student rate and you get it cheaper. Um, but in this, you're going to find really relevant stuff like this This one here. Um, this was come a couple of years uh, ago. But hey, first topic, synchronizing systems engineering and testing about, which is kind of what we're talking about here, right? Uh, how about model-based systems engineering to support de test-driven de uh, development? You know, really good. Like it's not like not um, it's not so in the weeds that you it doesn't apply. It only applies in one specific area. Generally, they're pretty good. Some of them are are, are, are deep uh, and, and very narrow, but generally they have a lot of good things in here that will help you, uh, regardless of what you're working and testing about. So you're not alone. There's the uh, the website up at the top right. Uh, there is a CTEP certification, a certified test and evaluation professional certification that you study their material, you take the test, and now you become a CTEP, which is uh, a really nice thing. If this is your, your thing, and then you can be certified. And, uh, and, and it's pretty good. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Regardless of what you're doing in tests, there's a couple key factors that I want to uh, kind of bring home to you. And that is, what does success in tests look like, right? So the first one is that testing is rigorous. What do we mean by that exactly? I'd ask the question, but let me just, let me help, help this along. So if you take a look at bullets three, four, and five, skip across number two, we talk about rigors. What we're really talking about is that, hey, can the conclusions be supported by objective evidence? Uh, subjective is fine, you know, we all have an opinion, but what we're really looking for is quantitative evidence to support uh, the test results and the test analysis, whatever the outcome is. Are the, are the results repeatable? So let me just put it this way. If your task is to determine whether a lawnmower starts on first pull 95% of the time, and you go pull the handle and it starts and you quit, you have absolutely almost no confidence that that's repeatable. Was it just by chance? Maybe it just happened to be a good a good day that it started. So there's not really any rigor there, is there? It's just like, well, we did it once and it seemed to work. Well, take that to your stakeholders, right? So the idea here is not just the fact that it happens once, but that it's repeatable and that your recommendations can be relied upon. And this is probably one of the biggest uh, failures that I see in tests is we want to be optimists and we do an experiment, we see what happens once and we go, well, that's good enough. But it's really not good enough for your stakeholders. Your stakeholder expects much more. 
uh, as does your management. So this is not something that you take lightly or you just throw together, but it requires really hard thinking, especially in light that there's not much time, there's not much money. So you have to be smart of how you do this statistically, whether you do a design of experiment or whether you're doing sensitivity analysis or ways to inform the test process is all very important in how you go about this. Um, the organizational piece I want to talk on, the technical integrity, yes, of course. And then this means that you're essentially qualified and that you have high ethical principles. I'm going to talk about ethics for just a second. Um, I was running these massive programs, okay, testing these operational tests, which is a scorecard for these sometimes billions of dollars in these systems. And the amount of pressure that you get to maybe change the result a little bit or maybe see the see it in a little different light that's really maybe not be maybe it's an error of omission or maybe it's an error of commission but it's something that is that maybe changes uh, the way something is perceived is enormous and i just can't tell you when i say enormous it's like giants that i know that's not a word but i would kind of for that, it's, it's just, it's tremendous. So the ethical principle part of being able to stand your ground uh, and to kind of be the, 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 the hairy eyeball, if you will, to be able to truly evaluate unbiasedly and then to call it like it is and not to, to uh, cave to these uh, pressures is, is, is huge. So if you're someone that just likes to go with the flow and doesn't like to create conflict, then this is probably not a good business for you. But if you don't mind, you know, kind of staring the giants down uh, based on your uh, your evidence and your test results, then it's it's really it's really good. And your stakeholders expect you to hold your ground. So it's not like you don't have someone behind you, but you do have to be strong and you have to be very ethically courageous. I guess would be the right. Next slide. Okay, the conundrums. Right, when, where. What is when, what, when, where, how, and then when do we stop? And uh, the when to stop is really important. Uh, we often miss that as we think about success and test means that the article passes or does something wonderful, the system does something wonderful, but the truth is when to stop has nothing to do with system performance, has everything to do with when you're statistically done with your test, that you have enough evidence that you have success criteria. We have a successful test. And now we can go analyze the results, whether they be positive or negative, right? Whatever that happens to be. We miss that uh, very often in our uh, in this idea of when do we stop. Next slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit about these. So a couple uh, kind of basics, but they're obvious, but then they're not so obvious. So first off, one is test is going to happen uh, whether we test it or not. Right? Because at some point, the end user is going to get this thing, and I can guarantee you they're going to test it. So the question then becomes to the project manager that says, hey, we're running behind schedule. We, you know, we don't have as much money as we thought. Let's cut some of our testing now. Well, the question then becomes, well, that's fine. Just, you know, the job then is just make sure they understand where the risk falls. Do we want to assume the risk in the development or do we want the risk to fall with the end user and have an escape to the field where it may cost us you know, a couple orders of magnitude more? Right, so these are the kinds of hard decisions that need to get made. If this idea that hey, if we don't test it, everything's going to kind of sneak, uh, get up, just kind of creep under the carpet. No one's going to know. No, it's going to get out. This just depends on who finds it. Right now, uh, some of that goes to life cycle. Like how long do we are the customers and the end users going to have to find it? Well, we have a very short life cycle, maybe not as much time. Uh, but in some cases, we still don't be surprised. Some of our systems go. And get killed is for a lot longer than expected. In the case of the B52 here, 55 years plus now. Uh, and I actually tested this jet and flew it. And I was doing the walk around on this B52, and there's all this stuff hanging like in the in the landing gear wells and all this stuff. And you see wires kind of kind of in a box that are disconnected and wires harnesses go in place. So I was, and it's not connected to anything. I was like, what what is all this? And it says, well, it's 55 years old. We just, we stopped using this stuff. We just never took it off the jet. So there's still stuff like on there where obsolete stuff that's just, that are there that's not doing anything. And you're like, well, you know, that makes me, uh, it makes me uh, not feel so good actually. But anyway, I flew this thing. Uh, and it was so old that, you know, the yoke is, there's no more paint on it. It's absolutely just like a polished 
you know, like a polished piece of chrome, but it's not chrome. It's different because it's been handled so much. And over the years, it's just kind of, it is what it is. And, uh, but anyway, uh, something to consider. Go to this, go to the next slide. The reality. All right, you may think that the system is perfect, right? And that when you test it, you don't find any deficiencies. And the truth is, is that's just not realistic. We know there's problems and test it's starting to find those problems. The, the next one is that the product isn't perfect, which is probably a good guess with reality. And when you test it, let's say you don't find any deficiencies. Well, then the testers fail, right? So what we'd like is this third point, which is where we know the product or the system's imperfect. We want to do uh, the test. And the testers find problems, so we succeed. And you go, okay, but let's put that now into the proper context. It's not just the fact that you find something and you succeed, but the, the goal is, is that you've got to find the problems that matter, right? And you want to do it quickly and you want to do it affordably. If you're not doing it quickly and affordably, your project manager, your team's going to fire you as a test engineer. So you've got to be smart on being able to find the right things and quickly and then fix them and do it affordably. That's the trick to test. Okay. And that's what makes it hard. Just to find problems, you know, you can find problems. This is the key, and we'll talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about maybe how we do some of these things. Go ahead, do the next one. Well, you might do something like this and say, well, here's some problems. Uh, here's a risk chart. So we know there's uncertainties. In this case, you know, number one up at the upper right is that's a helmet mounted device integration. So I won't tell you a program. This is actually a program. Um, I changed it a little bit. I didn't want to leave everything like it was, because but I changed some numbers around it. But, but certainly that would be something we would want to look at, right? This is something that could be a real problem. So you can use things like this to generally help you in some general systems. And you say, well, how do you build something like this? Well, uh, this one was built by an EOA. And you said, what's an EOA? It's an early operational assessment. So as you start to put the, the, the beginnings and the, the, work, the, inter, the initial workings of a system together, you get a bunch of uh, uh, subject matter experts together and you look across how we propose uh, putting this, uh, in this case, uh, this aircraft together. And you say, here's some areas we think are gonna be problem areas. Here's technology problems. We got you know, interface problems. This has never been done before. In this case, it didn't have a heads up display. It was all gonna be done in the helmet. So how do you integrate that with a night vision device? I mean, there are all kinds of like state of the art. How do we do this? Uh, so you can do that through established protocols. It's not like you just have to go, well, I don't know, let's just start. But there are actual app, there are protocols and methods that are already established. So you do this kind of stuff. So it's not like you have to make it up. You just have to follow existing protocols. It'll help you get some essay as to what problem areas are. Uh, go to the next slide. Now, as you do that, uh, we've got to find a balance, right? So you have quality bottom, cost going up. If you spend all your time doing quality and you want really high quality, you can see that the little dash line, which is the VVT cost, starts to get ex exponentially high as you get higher in the quality. And then, so if you want really high quality, you're gonna pay for it. It's kind of like, you know, law of diminishing returns. If you want the last 10%, it's really gonna cost you, right? But you also have a failure cost up here that, uh, it's also important, right? If you don't do anything, your failure cost is probably going to be pretty high. So what you're trying to do here is to find a balance on the bottom where you're getting acceptable levels of quality and you're also getting acceptable levels of failure. And that curve, you might say, well, that's easy. It's uh, your Mars off. It's just right, it's right, it's right there. That's where the uh, that's where we want to be. Well, the problem is, is finding that area is really difficult because there's so many uncertainties in them. So what you really try to do here is you try to get on the bottom of that curve someplace, uh, and then you make adjustments as you run through a, uh, the development of a program, right? Because you're not gonna be able to get that like on day one, but you will eventually over time, work your way into that area as you make adjustments and you have more discovery and more learning that's occurring uh, with your uh, complexity in your system. Go ahead, uh, the next slide please. I'm going to skip across this uh, slide pretty fast. Just realize that finding the balance and kind of understanding uh, how much or, or little comes with a cost. And it's just not a, a money cost, okay? You say, well, it's just going to cost us more. No, 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 no. 
know, there's an operational cost here. There's a mission cost. You know, there's a marketing cost. There's uh, uh, all of these these things. So if, if you test too much and things are delayed, uh, then hey, uh, we're spending too much, and that's going to drive profits, right, or other things. And if you don't do enough, then customers really get upset with you. So it's not just a fact of money. I mean, it will eventually end up in money, but you have a reputation that you're trying to uh, uphold. And then in a military context, same thing. You know, if you're too, if your test too much is too late, then it doesn't get filled in time. The capability doesn't get filled in time to be used in, let's say, some kind of combat situation or uh, or not. So it's, uh, you know, there, there's real life consequences of this, which is why the stakes are high. When you talk to test interval, it's not like, well, we kind of get it. No, you really need to put your best foot forward on this. And if you don't, trust me, you're not in the business very long because the program managers and the stakeholders don't have time for it. Okay, it's just as simple as that. They really trust the test and the functions to get this right. Uh, let's go to the next. Let's talk magnitude and rigor for just a second. You may say, well, how much and what are we supposed to do from a magnitude and rigor perspective? So go ahead and build it a couple of times. There's a couple of builds on this. Are you there? Yeah, I want one more. I want one more. Okay, that's good. So the question is, you say, well, Martin, why don't you just give us the answer? Because there are no answers, okay? <laughs> it all depends. And that's what's the beauty of like a graduate level course uh, or in in inquiry into this topic is because there's no one size fits all. You say, well, isn't there like a one size? No, there are no one size fits all. Everything is different. Okay. You can even say, hey, benchmark from one to the other. There's always differences and changes, and everything gets should get tailored to the to the task at hand. It's what makes it so much fun, is that there is no one answer. It all depends. So the first question is, who are my stakeholders and what do they value? That's going to drive a new test strategy, right? Of how much are you putting into this? Next question: what's the right mix of test cost, test schedule, test rigor? Well, in program management, we talk about the entire triangle, which is cost, schedule, and performance. Well, in test, it changes to cost, schedule, and rigor. And think of rigor as test depth. How deep are we going into the test? How much confidence do we have? May go then say test to define the test objectives. When we talk test objectives, it comes down to the verb. <laughs> Okay, and, and, and I'll, I'll, this sounds very elementary, but it's so important. That I'm, I'm gonna, when you talk to a test engineer and you say determine, or you say evaluate, or you say demonstrate, that has a very specific meaning to those people. It's not that you can just say, hey, we're gonna do and evaluate something. If you say evaluate, that is a specific term that has a specific connotation. Okay, so what I, was, what I mean by that is if you're not a test engineer, and you're talking with them, and you hear a word like that, and realize a verb, the verb has very specific meanings. It's not something to be thrown around. It's not something to say, well, I meant to say this. It be very, be very precise with your language because the lexicon is important when it comes to the test. And I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. And then the other one is, what data do I need to satisfy the objective? So I'm gonna, uh, if you're doing development or developmental tests, and I'll explain to what those are in a moment, our, our verification, I need those so development tests, developmental tests, or verification. You're on the H naught. You're on the null hypothesis. Okay, um, you're you're going in saying the system is bad, and the system has to prove itself to get to the alternative hypothesis, which is the H one. So those of you that have no statistics know what that involves, right? If you're doing operational tests or the validation. The H naught is that the system is good, okay? And you're going to the alternative or hoping not to go to the alternative, which is the system is bad. So the burden of proof happens in both of them, but the way they happen is different, okay? From one to the other. So just know that as we start to talk about these different OTs and ETs, what's happening there. Go ahead. Uh, I'm gonna skip across this quickly. Just realize that when we're doing, trying to find knowledge, is not everything requires the same amount of work, right? Some we can do comparison and we get enough confidence that we can move forward with a comparison. 
Maybe we can do some modeling or simulation or analysis. The point is, is don't get caught up that, hey, if we're doing tests in the valve or some of these things, it always has to be done to the most highest degree. The truth is, is that it doesn't. And there's not enough time and money to do it that way anyway. So part of being efficient in your test is understanding where on the scale you need to be and then uh, picking the right one so that you get the, the confidence that you need uh, without investing too much time or money, hopefully. There may be some that you do have to put a bunch of time and money on, but we don't want to do that unneedlessly. Next slide. Uh, next slide. This is a verb. So I've got demonstrate, I know it's an eye chart, so don't try to read this, but I've got demonstrate, determine, evaluate, and verify. And, and these are some definitions, okay? And uh, I'll just show you that they, they do matter in this uh, verify. You'll see over here that it requires concise knowledge of statistics in order to determine the number of acquisitions to perform in order to have a given level of confidence that, you know, in this case, some reboot rate has been uh, determined. So uh, know what these are, and then you can pick and choose. This is part of getting the right balance in your test design. And where do we need to be on this? Next slide. Testing about master plan. Uh, many folks think, hey, te testing about master plan haven't towards yet. No, the testing about master plan is drafted. It's one of the first articles that gets drafted. Go look at, if you look at the NASA chart, of, this is one of the first documents uh, that gets drafted. And it gets drafted this way because this is how you the uncertainties. Your testing about master plan is a strategy that is used to handle the uncertainties in your program. Okay, that's what it is. Uh, doesn't won't tell you exactly what the test plans are, but it's going to lay out the framework for all of where we think the uncertainties are, where the risk, how are we going to deal with that, how are we going to manage it, what facilities do we need, do we need to build facilities, do we need to rent facilities, and so on and so forth to be able to handle the uncertainties. Very important document gets upgraded across essentially the life of the uh, of the, of the uh, system development. Next slide. Okay, let's talk. I've, I've got about ten minutes here. Uh, and then I'm going to be done. So let's go through some of this. So I'm going to lay some frameworks out for you. So what I'm getting ready to tell you is debate. I'm going to offer you something uh, that's established, but I'm, I'm going to caveat it right now. Say uh, if you pick up this book, this is Engel's book on verification, validation, and testing of engineering system. He's going to give it to you a little different. Okay, so just realize that, uh, and if you look at a half dozen other books, they're all going to probably give it to you slightly different too. But I'm going to give you two established ways that I think you can use, and then just realize that there's some offshoots along the way. So first thing is, let's talk about the three areas. We have development test, developmental test, and then operational test. Okay, so the last two, where we have the AL at the end, the de developmental and the operational, deal with system level uh, testing. System, so you have a basically an integrated system, not subset, systems that you're looking at, okay? The development test up at the top deals with everything before then, okay? So if you're doing a verification that is part of a component or a subcomponent, or maybe you're doing some exploratory work, that's development test, okay? Uh, when you finally get to system level work and you're going to like see if we did we build it correctly, that would be for that we're not doing operation and still doing develop that would be developmental tests, then operational tests is a validation. Uh, I'll give you uh, what this looks like. Uh, next slide. So, this is what it looks like. Uh, we've got all this. Is that's the you've got a lot of green here. That's development tests. And that's what you call it. Hey, we're doing a development test. It can be just about anything. Any place where you're seeking knowledge or verifying, that's developmental test. And then when you get over towards the end, with system verification, we're doing developmental tests, and then we're doing operational tests at the end. That's the Cozy to Call book. That's how they set it up in the book. I kind of like it. Next slide. In Cozy, well, they, and this is out of their B and B uh, guide. Uh, they just talk verification and validation. Uh, and if he just says verification and validation, that is element, okay? Some kind of engineering element size, so smaller, not system related. And when they talk system, go to the next slide. 
they're going to say system verification or they're going to say system validation. That's how they discriminate. So if they're just talking about D and D, that's subcomponent elements, things like that. And when they say system level, it will be um, uh, stated as such. Go to the next slide. Okay, key differences. We have DT, which is what y'all classify as development tests or developmental tests, and then we have operational tests. So if you're doing D DT, it's controlled by the program management. Uh, it's in a generally in a controlled environment. Contractors or the developers can be involved. Um, what kind of operators? The trained, experienced operators, right? Probably test, probably test people. Um, you're going to test to a specification, and it can be a developmental and engineering, or it can be a production of a test one. Okay, that's development or developmental test. When you go to operational test, the game changes, right? Because we don't want the developers cooking the books on the system. So now it's going to be independently done. We're going to have independent agency, many on many tests in a realistic operational environment, which means we're going to put it in the field. Okay. No system contractors, normal operators, and then the performance measures are going to be effectiveness and suitability, which is what I showed you earlier in some of the scorecard stuff. Okay. And it's going to be production representative. It's not going to be generally like an engineer solution. It's going to be something that comes off the production line. Like, hey, we want to see what the real thing is going to look like. Next slide. Uh, I'll go quickly through this. So your OT, as mentioned, you have a categories of operational effectiveness and we have suitability. And the hard part is all these illities here. You know, reliability, maintainability, supportability, compatibility. In my opinion, those are really tough. Uh, performance can be tough, but it generally gets so much attention. You generally can get the performance or the effectiveness pieces, but the suitability aspects are oftentimes missed. Next slide. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this for time. This is just reliability. Well, we'll, we'll do another talk on this. I'll get with uh, Dr. Paglioni and we'll do some reliability stuff because this seems to be the toughest area. So let me just go quickly through a couple of things I think uh, are helpful and I'll be done. So first one is shift left. Now this seems very elementary, but I had units that uh, did things sequentially and I did things in parallel. And what we're talking about here is kind of like agile software development where you have a stakeholder or a customer who's pretty involved in your process. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're taking the operational test aspect and the people that are really concerned with, uh, or do we build the right thing? And we're moving them to have more early and frequent involvement with the developers. So instead of getting something at the end, an operational test that doesn't meet our needs, we're essentially taking those, those representatives uh, and we're moving them much forward in the process. Okay. And if you go to the next slide, what this looks like is this. Instead of doing things from a DT to an OT, we're doing things in parallel. And I've got, I had about a third of my units that were doing the bottom of paradigm and about two thirds that were doing the top. And the difference in success that we had uh, on this bottom of how we were integrating this correctly was three times better than what I had in any of my other years. So it seems elementary, it makes sense. We get this in the software business, but doing this within actual hardware, software, you know, big, massive programs where you have a, de a developmental test function that's happening in one part of the country, you have an operational test aspect that's going to test it in a different part of the country. And they don't talk and frequently interact, it's just problematic. Congre I try to change it, a congressional channel. When we try to change this from a state perspective, they tell uh, the state of California they're no longer going to be doing developmental tests on a B 52, and they said, well, not so fast. So this was uh, politically caught up and very difficult to change. Next slide. Uh, go, yeah, this is some stuff from uh, Dr. Borky, so I'll just kind of go through this quickly. Go to the next slide. So you can do this. You may say, well, gosh, things are so complex. You don't, you can do this to an integrated simulated environment uh, like this. When you start with like a CONOPS or an operational uh, simulation that goes to in the process, 
which would be like use cases and user roles that then feeds down into a design and some kind of logical architecture that then ends up in a physical architecture. And so you're basically building depth, right? It's not just operational, but you build this depth in your simulation environment. And then what you find as you run the MS across these different levels is that the bottom then starts to drive back up to the top, right? So it starts to inform across. So if you go to the next slide, it can kind of look like this, where you have a, in the middle a system prototype. This is a this is courtesy of Dr. Borky. Tom, you've got some of this, but I this really works. And I think this is absolutely the way to do it today. So you're not guessing at it, but you can run a system prototype. It can be a physical prototype and it can be a virtual prototype that um, with these different viewpoints. And what you find on the right and green is that your a virtual a prototype, which is your volume simulation, can help extend your physical prototype and the physical prototype helps you inform or calibrate your virtual side. So you have both sides going on at the same time. Now this isn't a digital twin. Uh, okay, this that's not what I'm saying. A digital twin is a, uh, we can talk about that later, but what I'm saying here is that you can set up your, your, your structures so that it looks like this and you start to get all of these uh, great benefits where you're essentially validating the architecture be before the risk and expense of implementation. So this is doing it beforehand. This is good, right? Hey, let's get the design errors and the you know, improper operating conditions and other stuff early. This does help you do that. The affordable exploration of the design experience will the what is. You can do this. You can do it very cheaply, right? And there's a couple other things here that's really beneficial to using a framework like this. And we can do this today. Right, this isn't like the 1970s. I mean, this is 2023. This gets done, and this is the way I think we should be doing it. Next slide. Uh, I'll go again. So this is just a, a design of an experiment. Um, the truth is, if you're doing any kind of, in my opinion, T and E today, uh, you really got to do it smartly, which means you're probably doing a sensitivity analysis to find out what are the variables that really matter. And then you're running test scenarios across those variables. You're not just making a guess or certainly not doing OFAT, right? One factor at a time. You're uh, you're doing this because not only do you get to see the contributions of each factor of each variable, but you also see the interactive effects that are so important. This is, this is good. Uh, Jeremy Daly uh, teaches some of this in his class. Um, so, um, I teach it in mine too, but I don't get into a lot of depth, but this is really good stuff. Next slide. The HALT, uh, uh, highly accelerated life cycle test. The truth is we don't have a lot of time to do the test. So there's ways like doing accelerated life cycle testing or stress testing that can help you find problem areas early. Um, so there's a lot of goodnesses. So this isn't like the only way to do it. There's some other ways, but things like this can also be Part of your bag of tricks so it's not generally in tests it's not one thing or two things you kind of have to have a kind of a bag of tricks kind of a nice you know smorgasbord if you will kind of like we have over here with the pizza nice kind of layout you have different options and you get to kind of pick and choose and kind of put the puzzle together which is in my opinion part of the fun of doing tests next slide lots going on in industry trends so some things here, digital engineering. Uh, you have digital twin, we've got test driven development, we've got MBSE stuff, LBC, uh, Marie Vance uh, is doing LBC work uh, in, a, in, in here at the university and that's really important. Uh, it can be really helpful in our tests. And then this one is, you know, how do you handle all the knowledge and the info? Cause you just get bombarded, right? With so much. So. Classes like from Steve Simsky that offers, hey, how do we deal with the analytics, uh, the big data, some of the, the data uh, issues, AI, ML kinds of stuff is all very helpful in helping us kind of understand not just that you have numbers, but what does it mean, right? That's that's part of the problem is that is understanding, hey, what is how do we do the analysis? And if you can get that part straight, you can also get great insight and more affordable, more efficient, more effective tests. Uh, which is what we're expected to do. So all these things are, are great and important uh, areas. Next slide. I think that's it. Don't forget this. 
I don't care. You know, you can all that other stuff's great, but if you're not doing this, you're missing it. Your stakeholders still expect you to do this. You know, all right. So this is you don't get it. You don't get to slip on this. The, the, whatever, whatever the, all the prior is, all wonderful, but you still got to do this. If you aren't doing this, you're missing it. Okay, so don't forget that. Next slide. I think that's it. A bunch of references here. You know, as a college professor, I you know put kind of put that in there, and I think that's good. I put it there also, so if you get a copy of these slides, you can kind of get an idea of where I think. I have things in here that I just didn't talk, but there's a lot of references here that just just good to have. You know, we got the angle book and other things. So. Uh, Take a look, and um, hopefully it, this has been valuable to you. Next slide. Okay, I'm done. How far? Yeah, I'm seven minutes, eight minutes. Well, okay. I want to be down at 45, 10, 53, but we're, we're done. Very good. Ah, okay. So let me let me take some questions because I, I know there's some out there. So whether it be classroom or online, please, uh, for 10 minutes or so, let's chat. Hey, Dr. Marzoff, can you hear me? Oh, sorry, we're muted. Give, give me a second here. Give us a second. Anything in the classroom? Yeah, we can hear you, Rob. No problem. Okay, okay. We can hear you now. Hear you now. Go ahead. Hey, Dr. Marzoff, Rob Baker, a PhD student. Uh, I'm glad you re-emphasized your comment near the end about stakeholder expectations. I ran a large portion of the project management side of a 2012 iot &E of an army program and i saw the pressures on some of our testers uh, sometimes it felt adversarial uh, and i'd like to offer the group here that you should trust in the fact that someone above the test group and above the program management group is ultimately going to make the risk decisions and the life cycle decisions and and they're really major decisions with very large costs and we saw the tester recommendations act as a forcing function to correct some of our program problems and lead to the best outcome for eventual users. So it's just a, a real world confirmation about your earlier comments that stakeholders expect you to hold your ground and to be strong and ethically courageous when reporting results. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Yes. How do you uh, accelerate? Like, how do you do the accelerating life cycle test? I I've heard of accelerating stress testing, like mm -hmm. stressing out the material and seeing when it breaks. But how do you do that? Is that just simulations, or is that? Yeah. It, can you all hear me online? The question was, uh, how do you do accelerated uh, testing? Correct. Right. Did, did, did y'all hear that? Okay, I'm getting some thumbs up. Thanks, Marshall. Um, yeah, so it's a, it kind of depends on who you talk to. Okay. Okay. I would like to tell you that there's just one accepted way. So you see it, the stuff on a television, like uh, the, the car being shook on a rack. It's like, hey, it's been on here for five years now, and it's still being shook. You know, and, and or putting things on like a treadmill and seeing how long something could go before it breaks. And um, a guy by the name of O'Connor, who's written several books on this, and I'd be interested to get Vinny uh, Paganini's take on this, generally says that's just not effective. The truth is, is that um, you don't really have enough time uh, or money just to put something on there and just wait till the end of time to see what happens. Plus, it doesn't really necessarily uh, represent how the article or the system is being used by your consumer. So what I would offer is if we're going to do accelerated kinds of tests, then what we're really interested in is not necessarily seeing about reliability, but we're looking at more uh, robustness in design. Uh, if that makes any sense, you like a robust or resilient design. So what we mean is, is we're going to put something in a, a, put the system or a component or some part of the system in a situation, and then we're going to stress it in ways that may not even be a, a realistic representation of real world, but we're going to stress it until it breaks. And then we're going to analyze how it broke and say, oh, there's something here that broke. 
And then we're going to uh, do some analysis and determine whether or not that is something that we can make better so that when it does go up and end up in the field, we have a more robust or resilient design. So I kind of delaying accelerated from reliability. Um, the reliability aspects is a whole other topic. And I'd love to talk to you on sidebar about reliability. And I'm sure uh, Vinny Paglioni will as well. Um, but that's how I generally, when you see it, that's that's how you do it. Now you may say, well, that means we got to break stuff. Yeah. And that means how many do we have to break? Like, do we need to break one of them or do we need to break four of them or do we need to break a dozen of these things? What's the right number? And that's also up for debate of how many do you actually break? How many are you, do you have access to break? Um, so that's when we think, when I think accelerated, and that's the difference really between an accelerated test versus like a design of experiment, where you're going to design of experiment, you're going to run a set of experiments and you're going to collect different numbers from across different variables. And then you're going to do some mathematical analysis on it. And it's going to show you what's going on empirically on that design. When you're doing accelerated test, get to the bottom line much faster. It doesn't mean that there can't be value in the treadmill, but it may be test for reliability aspect. But it's not, it's not, I don't think it's going to be overly helpful early because we're trying to make design changes and try to understand not just that it not that it'll last, but how will it break. There's a difference, right? One is will it last? The other one is how can we make it break? I like to break stuff. I like to celebrate the test. Really fun. But that's that's how I see it. And that's how if you look at books like O'Connor and other books, I really like O'Connor's books. Some of them are in the references. I would refer you to them because I think I think he. Having a look at the full gamut of tests, I think that approach is the correct approach. Yeah. Other questions, comments? We have a question online here. Hey, Dr. Chong is with us. Hi, Dr. Chong. Hello. Thank you for okay. that talk. Uh, all right, let me look. I work in the Air Force, okay, doing DT and E. For cyber systems, with the adoption of agile, do you have any thoughts on this? How to embrace agile and testing while sticking to the milestone event? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. Is that Marshall? Marshall, thanks for asking that. Yeah, I I think that uh, so, so. A couple uh, quick things is I do consulting in industry, and everybody wants to use agile. Everything's now agile or digital thread or digital something. Um, and if like they don't even know what they're saying, but they say it because they think it's a cool word. Um, but the truth is, is this idea of being able to do things, you know, agile doesn't mean faster, but it means more responsive, right? Um, and with the changing world, as fast as it is, things are changing. Like you start out on a, on a requirements and you go for two years and you just realize that the, the average acquisition time on a 5,000.02 DOD acquisition is over 10 years. So things are changing, right? And it may be in ways we don't even understand. So to be able to have some agile aspects uh, in there, which means flexibility to respond and adapt is really important. So you can do that through a number of ways. And it's not just process, but it's also adding additional, like a PQ die, a pre-planned product improvement, or having things built into your system that allows you to make changes and some flexibility later without having to redesign the system. So when I think of agile, when we're doing more hardware, longer term systems, I think of it in terms of how do we build in to the, uh, into the system the agility that we could use down the road. So right here, the perfect example in front of this idea, uh, magazine, we have the V, but then it has possible events during the operation. It's all these unknowns, right? So how do you, so the agility, I think it's built in that way. It doesn't mean that you can't do agile, like shift left, bring the, the customers in early, stay more in tune with changing developments. But I would just offer you that even if you do that, to some extent, you're going to be caught off guard. You're going to be caught off guard. It's, the world's changing too fast. And things are happening too quick. So you, you've got to build enough uh, capability. It might be that you add in additional ability to handle software because you can do an awful lot with software, right? So there's a number of techniques that I think you build in that helps you with the agility of the system. As far as agility of build, um, I like what Lad Curtis said, which is when he was building a space plane, he basically said, 
Um, you know, at the end of the day, you got to have a space plan. So changing requirements, you know, some of these you can do it certainly with software, and some of these hardware-based systems, it's just not as easy as that, in my opinion. So I don't know if that's helpful, Marshall, but that would be my. Well, my was maybe let's yep. just thank our speaker okay. for time. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Marzoff. And uh, you know, if, I think it, it, it sounds like actually there's some more conversations yeah. that can be had here. So I'm sure. So uh, let's clear let's clear folks off then, and then if you want to hang, I'll sit. I'll take questions here for a little while. That sounds awesome. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, so tidbit. Uh,